Good evening. Hello, everyone. My name is Leona Hollingsworth. I am the Acting Director of Metrolinx's Community Engagement Team for the Young North Subway Extension. I'd like to welcome everyone to our sixth virtual open house on the Young North Subway Extension. We know that this is a busy time of year, so I'll remind you that this session will be recorded and posted for those who can't stay with us for the whole session, and that you have the opportunity to send us questions anytime on our Metrolinx Engage platform. We will also be holding a second virtual open house on this topic on January 5th, 2022, for anyone who is not able to make it this evening. It is my pleasure to be the moderator for this evening's event. As moderator, it's my job to keep the event on time, to ensure your questions are heard and answered, and to make sure we get to as many questions as possible in the time available. Thank you again for your interest in joining us here this evening and for your interest in this project. An important note, this event is being closed captions. To use this feature, enable it on your video player. To begin, Metrolinx acknowledges that it operates on the traditional territory of Indigenous peoples, including the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. In fact, we acknowledge that the Young North Subway Extension is occurring on lands covered by the Gunshot Treaty 1788 signed with the Mississaugas, and which is within the Williams Treaty's territory. We recognize Treaty 13, 1805, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and we acknowledge the Fort Albany Nanfan Treaty of 1701 with the Haudenosaunee. Metrolinx is committed to building meaningful relationships with Indigenous peoples and to working towards meaningful reconciliation with the original caretakers of this land. Thank you for joining me in that moment. I'm now going to quickly go through the format and introduce our panelists, then we can get into the content for this evening. There is a call-in option for tonight's event. In your registration email, you received a link to join a Zoom meeting, but you can also just select Join Zoom on the event page. In the Zoom room, you can raise your hand to ask a question live to our panelists. Please take a quick scroll through the existing questions before posting yours, and if you see one that covers your area of interest, vote it up. If you'd like to ask a question but don't feel comfortable speaking, post it in the Zoom room chat and my colleagues will share. We have scheduled this session to last 90 minutes. We'll begin with a short presentation and then we will spend some time answering the top voted submitted written questions from our Engage site. From there, we'll head into the Zoom room for some of your live questions. Please note again, written questions will be answered based on votes, while call-in questions will be taken on a first-come, first-served basis. We want to get to as many questions as possible, so we'll aim to keep each question and subsequent answer to three minutes. We will answer all questions pointed to Engage or in the Zoom chat, even if we don't get to them tonight. The team will respond to your questions as soon as possible and post answers to the Engage site. If you've just joined us, this event is being closed captioned. To use this feature, enable it on your video player. On behalf of the panel, we look forward to a productive and positive conversation. We appreciate the ongoing connections we have with you and the time you've taken out of your evening to attend tonight. Your panel includes Stephen Collins, Program Sponsor for YNSC, Charlie Wang, Global Lead Transit Architecture and Technical Advisor, Raj Ketterpal, VP for Community Engagement, 905 Region, Maria Zinchenko, Manager, Environmental Programs and Assistant, Maria Doyle, Manager, Property Acquisitions. Azim Ahmed and Ali McHugh from the Young North Subway Extension Community Engagement Team will be taking your questions from the Zoom room. Also joining us for the Q&A portion, Michael Fetishin, Senior Vice President, Transit Oriented Development Program with Infrastructure Ontario, Sam Calandran, Engineer Technical Advisor, and Joseph Ehrlich, Manager of our Rapid Transit Project Planning. Thank you and welcome to your elected representatives, MP Melissa Lansman, Mayor Frank Scarpitti, Acting Mayor Joe DePaula, Deputy Mayor Don Hamilton, Councillor Keith Irish, and Councillor Karen Silovitz, who have also joined us this, tonight. At Metrolinx, we begin every meeting with a safety moment, as safety is the core, at the core of everything we do. For our safety moment tonight, I wanted to do something that fits with this time of year when the weather can be unpredictable and sometimes deceiving. Today was a good example of that. It definitely has not yet been cold enough to skate on a pond. Ice may look thick and inviting in some areas, but you do not want to end up in the water. This time of year, indoor skating or certified rinks are the option. Enjoy and wear a mask. Does anyone else on the panel have a safety moment they'd like to share? If not, we'll move the slides forward onto the agenda. 
And this just gives you a look of what we're going to talk through tonight, some of the project introduction and benefits, our route improvements, a proposal from the community and our analysis, property needs, Finch Early Works, geotechnical investigations, noise and vibration studies, early results, the project timeline, public engagement, and stakeholder outreach. And then we're going to talk a little bit about our community office. So with that, I will hand over to my colleague, Stephen Collins, to begin the presentation. Thanks, Leona, and good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. As the agenda shows, we do have a lot of information to share, so I'll move quickly through the presentation so that we can get on to the question and answer period. There are a couple of key items that I just want you to uh, uh, take away from the presentation as we go through them, and the first is that we're extremely excited to be moving this much-needed project forward. We have adjusted the route in response to community concerns, which is a normal part of our project development process. And we have done so while protecting all of the project benefits. And we have completed that detailed assessment of the Transport Action Ontario option, which I'll get into in the slides ahead. But we have identified a minimum of $230 million of incremental cost and the potential for some significant impacts to the secondary plan. As far as the uh, project benefits go, it's really important that, uh, that we continue to recap why we are doing this project and that all levels of government have identified the Young North Subway Extension as a critical project in the region's transit expansion program. The subway extension will complete the missing link and create the much needed rapid transit connection between York Region and Toronto. The metrics on the slide we have presented in the past and are really familiar to this group. And as a reminder, our confirmed station locations are being advanced given they provide the highest number of riders, maximize the transit network connectivity, and place the stations where the most people and jobs will be over the lifetime of the subway. Our technical work continues to protect the additional stations, including Cummer and Royal Orchard, and Metrolinx will work with the province and municipalities and region to pursue opportunities for their inclusion. Slide, please. What's important to us in developing a regional transit system is maximizing the network effect, giving people convenient connections between services that provide an excellent customer experience and maximize opportunities to shift auto users to transit customers. We presented the slide before, but we see it as a vital element of the project, so it's worth reminding ourselves. Bridge Station is a key hub with significant transit network integration, supporting efficient connections for people transferring from the subway to other transit services from all across York Region and placing convenient access close to where tens of thousands of people will live and work. Ancillary benefits of our bridge station by using the existing rail corridor and the space between Highways 407 and Highway 7, we've removed approximately 130 buses per hour from traveling along the municipal roads into Richmond Hill Centre and optimize the use of land, freeing up the space for other productive community building uses. Next slide. The adjusted route. Following our consultation with communities and feedback provided by residents, we reviewed our reference alignment, or the previous route as we're going to call it, below the Royal Orchard community in detail with the objective to travel below fewer homes and at a greater depth. This is notwithstanding that the reference alignment as originally proposed would have a nearly imperceptible effect on the community. We have completed this work and we'll share the results with you in the coming slides, but what's important to keep in mind is that we are now below 50% fewer homes and on average 10 meters deeper below the community, all the while protecting the project benefits and managing the costs. And our project will continue to have minimal effects on the community, including residential properties, parks, and the schools. Next slide, please. Just to, as a point of reference here, in March of this year, we presented the reference alignment, which is shown on the left side of this screen, and I'll either refer to it as the previous route or the orange alignment. And this is the alignment that we presented to communities as our reference alignment in March of this year. And again, following feedback from communities in the consultation process, and as part of our ongoing project development, we completed extensive work to reduce the number of properties we travel below while protecting the project benefits. Our adjusted route, as shown in green on the right side of the screen, which I'll refer to throughout the presentation, is the result of this hard work. It reduces the number of homes we travel below, places the tunnels deeper below the community, and eliminates most of the property requirements on the west side of Young Street through the Thornhill Heritage Conservation District. Next slide, please. 
As a reminder, the reference alignment veers slightly west of Young Street in the area just up on the upper uh, left portion of the slide. Heading east and placing the potential Royal Orchard Station on the existing commercial property at 10 Royal Orchard Boulevard. It then travels below the community, ultimately aligning below the CN corridor just south of Holy Cross Cemetery. This alignment provides the key project benefits and the innovative bridge station. With proven noise and vibration technology, we continue to be extremely confident that levels below the community during operation and construction of the subway will be nearly imperceptible. Nonetheless, and recognize the community feedback, we did develop our green route. Next slide, please. Our green route is presented here in detail. As you can see from uh, the slide, the subway stays on Young Street up to just north of Royal Orchard Boulevard, passing underneath the East Don River until it reaches north of Royal Orchard Boulevard, where it veers east of Young Street, very deep below the condominium at 8111 Young, and aligns under Baythorn Drive. It then travels deep below Baythorn Drive, Pomona Creek, and into the final curve before reaching the CN Corridor, in effectively the same location as the reference alignment. A few notable enhancements to call out here. The potential Royal Orchard Station is in the Young Street right-of-way, just south of Royal Orchard Boulevard. We have reduced the number of bends while maintaining all TTC requirements for curves and grades. This provides a slight decrease in the travel time and improved customer experience between Clark and Bridge stations. Now, I'll just spend a minute here. Um, you notice the alignment travels up Young Street, past the potential Royal Orchard Station, and goes into a curve that goes to the right or to the east, and then a curve that goes to the left or to the north. Both of these curves meet all of the required TTC standards for the, the degree of the bend and the degree of the slope. So we are meeting all of the TTC standards with this uh, adjusted route. It is this screen alignment that we are proceeding with our project development activities. We are quite excited about this adjustment as it is equivalent in cost and benefits while responding to some community concerns about the number of houses the subway travels below. Next slide, please. Taking a look at both the original reference route and our adjusted route in, in cross section or along these profile drawings, on the green route, the tunnels will be a minimum of 21 meters deep below the community, with the average depth increasing by approximately 10 meters over the original route. While increasing this depth is important from the perception of FX, it is technology we'll use to reduce noise and vibration that is most important. And for a full understanding, the tunnels below the homes in the vicinity of Kirk Drive and Thornybray Drive remain at approximately the same depth as the previous route. The reason being, as we are constrained by the level of bridge station and the maximum allowable slope for the subway. We can only get so deep so quickly, and it's through this area, again, Kirk Drive and Thorny Bay, we're approximately the same depth as we were on the previous route. And as we travel below Royal Orchard Park and along Baythorn Drive, we continue descending, approximately reaching a depth of more than 40 meters. We will need to acquire underground property interests from each individual owner, which I'll get into in more detail in the coming slides. Next slide, please. As most of you know, in the spring of this year, an organization uh, um, called Transport Action Ontario submitted two alternate alignment options to Metrolinx for assessment. The options as submitted by Transport Action Ontario are presented here. Option one on the left slide travels east-west through the center of the Langstaff Gateway area and option two travels diagonally through the same area. We have thoroughly reviewed these options and we'll take you through our work over the next few slides. Next slide, please. As presented, the TAO option one was not a viable or constructible option. The curves were too tight and the impacts on Pomona Creek, the utilities, Highway 407 and 7 structures and bridge station were significant and not addressed as part of the original proposal. Nonetheless, we took the principles of the TAO option one and developed an alignment option that reflects these principles. And that's what you're looking at on the screen. Our interpretation of the Transport Action Ontario option one, which was agreed to with Transport Action Ontario when we met with them last week, travels north on Young Street, 
It veers slightly west before curving east along the southern boundary of the gateway below a planned municipal road. The tunnels curve to the portal, which is the area where the subway travels from below ground to above ground in the, in the purple area before arriving at our bridge station. A few key technical matters to highlight here. The subway where it curves off of Young Street travels below three residential uh, properties and directly below two commercial properties. The subway travels below the northwest corner of Holy Cross Cemetery, albeit this is not a location where there are any burials. And curves six, which is the curve on Young Street, and curve seven, which is the curve where the purple portal structure is, are well below the TTC minimum standards have been, have been set essentially at the limitation of the tunnel boring equipment. So these curves do not meet any conventional standards. They are well below the TTC standards. Nonetheless, we established them uh, based on the constructability of them through a tunnel boring operation. The last thing I'll just mention from a technical uh, matters to highlight is our bridge station must be depressed by approximately five meters in order to navigate the complex conditions and meet the conventional standards for the grades of the subway. We'll get into a little more detail in the coming slide on the complexity of these and, and the, our evaluation of the overall option. Next slide, please. In general, we found that the Transport Action Ontario option one to be significantly higher cost, approximately $230 million more, adds complexity and risk to construction and reduces benefits and increases operating and maintenance costs. On the cost side, the capital construction cost is a minimum of $230 million more than our green alignment, which does not include any provisions for the significant cost impacts this route will have on the existing secondary plan and the timing for the planned Langstaff Gateway area. The Transport Action Ontario option is immensely complex to build. It requires specialized tunnel boring machines and tunnel liners due to the sharp curves. We'll travel shallow below Pomona Creek and the existing structure will need to be rebuilt while we are protecting the Enbridge gas pipeline, which needs to be crossed where the, where the proposed Transport Action Ontario option one uh, leaves Young Street. It also will require relocation of York's York Region's uh, transmission, uh, large diameter transmission water main, and the depressing a bridge station will actually challenge the technical feasibility of keeping the highway in operation while the underpinning and modifications of the Highway 407 and Highway 7 bridges is completed. If you think about it, what depressing our bridge station does is it requires us to excavate around the existing foundations that are holding up the Highway 407 bridge in order to do that, we have to very carefully uh, what we refer to as underpin. So very, take very small sections of that foundation and it essentially extend it down into the earth while that found, same foundation is holding up the highway. Our structural engineers took a look at it and theoretically came up with an option that uh, would see us being able to build that. But the reality of being able to do that hasn't been tested and would need to be worked through with 407 ETR and the Ministry of Transportation. The costs associated with the potential impact on highway traffic, specifically the 407, would be in addition to the costs already identified. And from an operations perspective, we completed runtime simulations, and despite the slightly shorter distance that the Transport Action Ontario option has, the tight curves added approximately two minutes of travel time between Bridge and Clark Station. This reduces the benefits of the project, and further, the tight curves will lead to higher wear and tear on the trains and track, and the noise created through the curves will lower the customer experience on the trains. So again, it's important to note, this is the noise that would be experienced by the folks riding on the trains, not the people who are on the surface or on the ground or in their homes uh, uh, beside or above this particular option. And th those tight curves would lead to uh, that squealing of uh, the train on, um, uh, on track noise. And that would uh, reduce the customer experience. And anyone who's traveled on the trains, uh, on the subway as it travels around Union Station would know exactly what I'm talking about. You can go to the next slide, please. 
Transport Action Ontario did present a second option, as I mentioned, and what we uh, identified is this is not a, a viable option for us for uh, a few reasons. Most notably is it precludes the ability to construct bridge station. Uh, the option presented a fairly uh, large curve as the subway traveled below Highway 7 and 407, and we can't build a station on a curve. Stations can only be built on flat and straight sections of track. However, based on our review of the Transport Action Ontario Option 2 and the objectives it tries to achieve, we identified that it closely follows the IBC Option 2, that is, stay on Young Street to north of the cemetery, place a station below the highways and achieve high-tech station adjacent to the existing rail corridor. As you know, following our rigorous business case evaluation process, the IBC option two was not preferred. And we concluded that a technically feasible Transport Action Ontario option two, which reflects our IBC option two, performs lower than the reference alignment and the adjusted alignment. Next slide, please. As with most major public infrastructure projects, we will need to acquire property along the route from French Station to the train storage facility. We strongly believe the addition of the subway to this area of Markham, Richmond Hill, Vaughan and Toronto will have a positive effect on property values for current homeowners. Metrolink's overarching objective is to work with owners of land we need for our projects to reach an amicable agreement. This is not easy, and we know it's not easy, but we'll always work with the owner to this end while following a transparent and unbiased process. And focusing for a minute on the properties we will tunnel below, Metrolinx needs to acquire the land, which is the below ground land. We don't need to acquire any property at the surface from these owners. We need to acquire the slices of soil that are deep below people's houses. To acquire these interests, we will compensate the existing owners at fair market value for their land the same way we would a surface interest. We will follow the applicable legislation and regulations for determining value and the compensation and work closely with each homeowner. It's very important to recognize that compensation is solely to acquire the property interest. In no way is this compensation related to any real or perceived impacts homeowners may believe the subway presents. We are compensating owners only for the land interest we require. And lastly, on property, we know that this is not easy, and we will work closely with each affected owner to explain the process, answer questions, and ensure you are provided with the necessary information and means to protect your interests. Next slide, please. Our Finch uh, Station Early Works is a contract or, or, or a project that we are uh, moving ahead with, and this is to essentially make the modifications at Finch Station so that the subway can connect into the existing Finch Station. There are significant complexities in this work, and as a result, we decided to proceed with it as an Early Works and essentially get it done before the large tunneling contract and the large station contract uh, uh, is is. Um, progresses. Our Finch Station Early Works is scheduled uh, for uh, procurement uh, starting this week, and I'm uh, pleased to report that we did release that uh, on uh, Wednesday of this week. So we are now out in the market on the first contract for the Young North Subway Extension project. Next slide, please. The geotechnical program in the Royal Orchard community remains ongoing, including borehole drilling and surveys. We acknowledge and thank the City of Markham and York Region for working closely with Metrolink's team to review and issue permits for doing the work. Our community relations team has been on site with our field crew engaging the community and answering questions. We know that most of you have seen this work taking place and a common concern from the community around the safe is around the safety of the work taking place for residents, pedestrians, and especially children walking to and from the neighborhood schools. Rest assured, safety is at the core of everything we do at Metrolinx. Case in point, we started our meeting with a safety moment, and we share the community's interest in protecting all people. To this end, our field teams have detailed safety plans in place, have scheduled work around the school start and end times, are working closely with our community relations staff to promptly answer residents' questions, and addressing concerns that come in continuously and to continuously adjust field operations. As an example, earlier this fall, the school asked that we suspend drilling while the St. Anthony's uh, Catholic Elementary School held their Terry Fox run. Our field team was happy to oblige 
albeit with only hours notice and suspended work, and left the area on Kirk Drive clean and free of hazards to the, for, the, for the students. Next slide, please. On our project timeline, uh, we are uh, sort of uh, at a, a crucial uh, moment in our in our project uh, lifespan or in our project life cycle. We've uh, sort of reached the point where we're starting to uh, issue contracts or starting to issue tenders for some of the construction activities, the Finch Station uh, case in point. And early in the new year, um, towards the later part of January, we're going to be issuing our environmental project report addendum. This is the EA addendum or the environmental assessment addendum that uh, contains all of the, the uh, background studies and information uh, particular to our project for public review. Uh, we are going to host some consultation sessions specific to our EPR addendum or environmental project report addendum towards the back end of January and early February. We're also uh, working uh, to uh, start our procurement process for our advanced tunnel contract. You see that as sort of the bullet in the um, uh, sort of February or winter 2022 timeframe. This is sort of getting out to uh, uh, start the process of hiring uh, companies and contractors to build the tunnel for us. And as we move through that advanced tunnel contract procurement process, we're going to be uh, sort of continuing to consult and engage with communities and develop our project designs. And so that by the time we reach uh, sort of 2023 and we're ready to begin construction, we've got a well-documented uh, and well-formed consultation and contract ready to go. Next slide, please. And just lastly on uh, the noise and vibration, I just want to take a minute to uh, sort of again highlight um, the progress that we're making in the early results that are coming in specific to the noise and vibration studies in Royal Orchard. And in recognition of this and with proven technology, our team can build and operate the subway well below the accepted standards and criteria for noise and vibration. The results will be nearly imperceptible effects on the residents and homes in the Royal Orchard community. This was the case on the reference alignment, and we are highly confident it will be even better on the green alignment. Of note is these technologies are in use locally on the Toronto York Spadina subway extension under the Schulich building and internationally on the Crossrail project, which travels below the Barbican Centre in London, which is an internationally renowned performance arts auditorium. And our work continues on the analysis, and we are taking the ongoing geotechnical information into our modelling and assessment. As this work is completed, we will share results with communities, including developing a physically immersive sound lab as part of our community office. And Raj will have more details on this in the coming slides. Next slide. Thank you, Stephen, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, so Stephen mentioned uh, off the top that consultation and regular engagement with communities and stakeholders started when we first shared our updated project plans uh, approximately eight months ago in March 2021. Since then, our Metrolinks teams have been active in our engagement in, in, in the community and with stakeholders. We have been listening actively to feedback from, from the community and stakeholders. We posted, uh, we're on our sixth virtual open house tonight. Uh, we presented at a number of municipal and regional councils. We've initiated a community table in the Royal Orchard community. Uh, we've been part of community walks. We've hosted community walks, met with residents in person and virtually uh, with many stakeholders. Our community engagement team has established a regular presence along the route. Um, Stephen mentioned as well that you know we've been out there with our geotechnical teams, ensuring that we're there to answer questions. Uh, we've distributed uh, 1,500 notices in advance of our geotechnical work to give ample notice to residents uh, in, in the area. And we've also distributed about 30,000 informational postcards to businesses and residents over the last few months. And we've got our second round of flyers that um, are in distribution now. All is to say that we want to ensure that folks are aware of, of the project, um, that they know who they can contact if they have any questions, and, and that we're readily available um, uh, every day of the week. Uh, just yesterday, our CEO, Phil Verster, shared an open letter uh, to the Royal Orchard community. Uh, the letter addresses the concerns and questions that we've been hearing and shares how, we will shares how we will continue to work collaboratively with the community to ensure it stays a peaceful place where people want to live and attracting new homeowners. The open letter is available on our Metrolinks Engage website under the YNSC project page. 
I want to emphasize that there will be many op more opportunities to share feedback and answer questions as this project progresses. As we move forward together on the project, we will continue to work together to maximize the benefits and outcomes for communities. Can go to the next slide, please. Over the last number of months, our teams have been meeting with property managers and identifying potential locations in the northern end of the extension for permanent community office. Stay tuned for more details on the confirmed location and opening. Once our office opens, our community relations team will be available to meet during regularly scheduled hours, answer questions at that location, and of course, will remain available through our usual other channels. Next slide, please. Can you advance to the next slide, please? Thank you. To support our community engagement outreach, we are developing a noise and vibration experiential program, which initially launched with our local subway tours. We've already taken several local leaders and people to observe firsthand how noise and vibration is reduced to nearly imperceptible levels above the Line 1 tunnel of the subway extension inside the York University Schulich, Business, Schulich School of Business. We are grateful to York University administration for accommodating our visits. The second phase of this program will include a demonstration using a portable scale model of track and train and track vibration isolation technology. Essentially, it's a small scale version of some of the modern improvement in noise and vibration technology in action. It's currently under development and we'll have this available at our community office and through our community engagement. The third phase, uh, phase of our program, as Stephen already mentioned, will feature an immersive interactive noise and vibration simulation that will be installed in a soundproof room in our community office once it's open. Participants will be able to hear for themselves what it will sound like when a subway train passes below homes. What's important to call out here is that the audio and video demonstrations are based on actual sound recordings of existing sound levels inside homes in rural orchard. And it'll bring to life how our proposed modern noise and vibration solutions will make future subway operations nearly imperceptible. We look forward to sharing more details with the community and stakeholders um, as they're available. In advance to the last slide, please. We always want to hear from you and stay connected. As you know, we recently announced our route improvements last week, and we wanted to ensure that we scheduled a virtual open house prior to the upcoming holiday season. And recognizing that there was short notice on tonight's virtual open house, we will have another one scheduled right after the holidays on January the 5th for those who were not able to join us this evening. And as mentioned at the top by Leona, that our virtual open house this evening is being recorded and will be posted on our Metrolinks Engage site. And with that, it brings me to the end of our presentation, and I'll pass it back to you, Leona. Thank you, Raj. Thank you, Stephen. Okay, I'm going to head to our Engage site now to go through some of the top voted questions for our panelists. So we'll do a couple here, and then we'll head over to Azim and Ali in the Zoom room to hear some voices. So our first question is a bit of a two-parter. <coughs> Explain the hairpin turn and deeper tunnel. Previously, we were told that a hair hairpin turn could not be accommodated further north on Young near Langstaff. Now it is showing up at Baythorn. Please explain. Also explain the impact of the presumably additional cost to tunnel deeper. Is the deeper tunnel requirement adding to the projected cost of the project? Stephen, I'm going to hand it to you. Sure. Thanks, Leon. So there are a few uh, pieces that I'll, I'll sort of try and answer there. Um, so in all of the options that Metrolinx developed, including the options that uh, came off of Young Street to tunnel below the Royal Orchard community, the options that would uh, consider going below the Holy Cross Cemetery, and with the exception of the Transport Action Ontario option, all of the options that we looked at that would uh, travel north of the cemetery and below the Langstaff Gateway and Highway area. All of the options that we developed were kept to meet the minimum geometric standards. So the TTC and internationally accepted standards have essentially prescribed that the minimum radius or the minimum curve that the subway can have is 300 meters. And so all of the options we looked at, including, apologies, the sort of lights in the office here keep turning out, um, all of the options that we looked at met that minimum 300 meter radius curve. And so when you see the presentation of the, uh, the green alignment that we have proposed there, we are not 
going below any of the minimum standards for geometry. It may uh, seem deceiving or it may not look that way when you're looking at uh, the slides that we have here, but I can tell you and I can confirm that all of our track designers and subway designers have used the minimum geometric requirements as the basic for the standard. On the cost side, the uh, the work that we have done, including the detail, excuse me, including the detailed cost estimates that we've prepared for analysis and and decision making on uh, the the adjusted route or the green alignment, um, resulted in the costs for the project staying the same as they were on the reference alignment. There were some changes on some of the the elements. For example, the green alignment is slightly shorter than the original reference route. But the, there are some increased costs on things like uh, the tunnel uh, depth. And so while there were what I'll say is pushes and pulls on those costs, the total cost of the green alignment remains the same as the total cost of the reference alignment. Thank you. Okay, we're going to give you a chance to get up and dance around to turn the lights back on there, Stephen. This one, I think... Um, what does practically imperceptible mean for noise and vibration? I think Maria Zed, that one might be for you to start. Thanks, Leona. My pleasure to answer the question. <clears throat> Excuse me. So for vibration, uh, this means that our vibration, our predicted vibration levels will be below the regulatory vibration limit and below perceptible level so in, in other words below what an average human can feel and for noise um, our studies predict that the sound levels will be substantially below the regulatory limits and about as quiet as an average whisper you can also think of it as sound of rustling leaves in the distance or the background noise in the broadcasting studio and we do anticipate that the adjusted route will result in further reductions in the predicted noise and vibration levels in many areas along the route um, within the Royal Orchard community. We can achieve this with the help of proven modern sound and vibration reducing technologies, which uh, Stephen referred to earlier in the presentation. And one such example is um, floating slab track, where you have concrete slabs um, that support the subway tracks um, being supported by rubber pads or steel springs, which essentially contain and isolate vibration and resulting noise generated by um, wheels of trains passing over the subway tracks. This technology is one of the most effective solutions out there to prevent passing trains from generating noise and vibration. And uh, that's the technology that has been used extensively here in Toronto um, along the Line 1 Young University um, subway extension as well as um, Line 4 Shepherd subway extension. Thank you, Maria. Next question. Can options one and two be reevaluated? Maybe we'll start with you, Stephen. Yeah, thanks, Leona. Uh, the quick answer is no. Um, we are proceeding with our project development on the basis of our adjusted route or our uh, green alignment. And that is uh, the route that we will be uh, sort of working uh, through you will see that route presented in our environmental project report addendum in January. And that is the route that we will be proceeding to develop our design on and develop our project on and ultimately uh, going out to our advanced tunnel uh, procurement with. Okay, I'll keep going. I'll do maybe two more and then we'll head over to the Zoom room. The next one is, is there going to be a station at Royal Orchard? either Stephen or Raj for this one? Yeah, I'll start and uh, perhaps Raj can, uh, can join in. Uh, so um, the, the, the answer on that is we don't know yet. Um, as I indicated in uh, sort of some of the opening slides, um, we uh, continue to protect for both Cummer Station and Royal Orchard Station in the design of the tunnels and in the design of the project. 
Um, however, at this point in time, neither Commer nor Royal Orchard Station are part of the project scope. Um, I mentioned that we are sort of proceeding with our project development along the green alignment. Um, we are proceeding with that as a four station project and doing our design development on that basis. However, we are also advancing the design of both Cummer Station and Royal Orchard Station as a parallel activity. So in the event um, that uh, the uh, project uh, uh, sort of funders um, elect to add one or both of those stations to the project, we're able to do so quickly and we're able to do so with minimal impact on the overall schedule. Thanks, Stephen. And maybe just to add to that, that, that we are working with the province and uh, the region of York to determine the feasibility of a station in the Royal Orchard community. Yeah. Okay, I'll do one more and then we can head over to Azim in the Zoom room. In the current plan, where are emergency exits and venting? I think this one is for you again, Maria Zed. Sure, thanks, Leona. So forthcoming um, environmental project report addendum, which is slated to be publicly released early next year, uh, that Stephen reviewed as part of his review of the project milestone schedule, will contain the information about the route, um, station locations, and um, other project elements like the emergency exits. So th those those details um, are something that we're working on putting together as part of the PR addendum preparation, and they will be available for public review um, early next year. And maybe I'll just add that once we, we do go out with that publicly, we will be having a virtual open house as well um, to, to share the details that have been posted and take some questions and, uh, and provide some answers. Thank you. Thank you both. Anything to add there from anyone? I will slowly move over then and ask Azim for some questions from the Zoom room. What do you have coming in over there, Azim? Thanks, Yona. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can. Perfect. Great. We have a question from Bill, and then we have a couple chat questions. So, so first to Bill. Bill may be on Bill? mute. We can't hear him. Okay. Yeah, because the host is not allowing me to unmute myself. I guess I'm unmuted now. Is that correct? Yes, we, we can, can hear you. Here. Go ahead. Good. Okay, Stephen, uh, I'm just uh, wondering where you get this idea that uh, there are fewer homes being impacted by the green project. Uh, you say 20. Uh, does that mean that you do not consider the 200... Uh, residences in 8111 Young Street to be homes? No, we consider those uh, condominiums to be homes. What we are saying is that we are traveling below fewer single family residential properties. You didn't make that clear and uh, you're, um, yeah. and I'm sure you're uh, familiar with uh, Ms. McHugh who is the Community Relations and uh, Issues uh, Specialist. Uh, where is this great uh, communication when she drops this information on the residents and homeowners at the uh, 8111 Yum Street on Wednesday, December the 8th, and makes the same statement? And her statement is uh, the very same one that you and uh, Mr. Verster made uh, yesterday that uh, there are fewer homes being impacted when in fact there are 220 homes. Is that not correct? Yes, there are fewer single family residential properties that the tunnels are traveling below, but we are traveling below the 8111 uh, Young Street condominium building. And I do understand that there are 200 condominium units in that building. Right, and that, uh, well, that uh, should be corrected. And I would ask when uh, Phil, or when Mr. Verster, and when uh, Ms. McHugh 
And when you are going to issue a statement correcting that, that there are actually 120 residences uh, that, or 220 residences that will be impacted. When can we expect that, uh, Stephen? So uh, if I understand the question correctly, you're looking for us to uh, confirm the number of condominium units that we're traveling below? Uh, that would be uh, very helpful. And also uh, where uh, Metrolinx has uh, tunneled below other condominiums in the GTA, that would be very helpful as well. Okay. And I have a second question, if I may, to uh, Ms. Doyle. Ms. Doyle, you're in charge of the procurement. And uh, you understand that with 200 homeowners uh, in 8111, that you would have to deal with uh, 200. Uh, uh, thank you, Bill. Um, I, I do understand that there's... Individually. Sorry, yes. I understand that there's uh, approximately 200 condominiums within that building. And when we engage in negotiations with 8111 will be going through the board to deal with the condominium as a whole because I believe that uh, what we're looking for property acquisition in that particular location would be common elements. And uh, uh, do I understand that you would be basing it on uh, the uh, present uh, valuation or on future valuation? For example, there's a uh, redevelopment project going just to the south of us with four towers with uh, 5,800 or 50, uh, 15, let me get this right, 1,500 uh, condominium units and uh, uh, 1,700 parking spots. The value of the uh, 8111 Young Street uh, could be re redevelopment if the owners were to. Uh, uh, get into partnership with a redeveloper, and uh, he may want to lower uh, the parking garage, say, by 40, 60 further feet down to that 100-foot level to accommodate five buildings on the redeveloped property. Uh, would that be impacted at all by uh, your right-of-way? So um, the first thing I'm going to say, Bill, is that when we engage in negotiations, uh, the value is, is developed by an independent appraiser, and it's, uh, the appraisal is done at the time that we plan to go undertake negotiations with you. So um, if we're ne negotiating with you in, let's say, five years, then that will be the period of time that that, that appraisal will be valid. Um, I can't speak to specifics, um, unfortunately, because I just don't know what it is that your condominium is proposing and whether you've gone into a development application or things like that. But we're happy to have that conversation uh, in the future when we, when we get to that point in time. Thanks, Bill, for the question and panel for the answers. We yeah, have some sort questions. of Azim, if I can just sorry, Azim, if I can just provide sort of a, two more sort of pieces of information for um, uh, Sir Bill. So the first is um, the tunnels are very, very deep below 8111 Young Street. Um, they're sort of at the upper end of 40 meters, approaching 50 meters deep, and this actually places them into uh, the bedrock, um, sort of below the soil and into the bedrock. That means that it won't have any impact on the foundation, uh, and it's quite far away from the foundation of the building. And the other uh, uh, sort of piece, and we'll sort of get some specifics uh, to you, Bill, on where else are we tunneling below condominiums. Um, as you may know, there are significant transit expansion taking place in the GTA right now, and uh, along our Ontario line, we have a number of condominiums and high-rise buildings that that Ontario line project is tunneling below. Thanks, Azim. Thanks, Stephen. We have a question from in the chat from Leo. It's about a uh, property, property question. I recently learned that our property is in a Metrolinx 300 meters right away. Why a property owner has not received a formal notification from Metrolinx? So um, I'm not sure if Maria, you want to try this? I will start, but I think really that it's not uh, specific to myself, so I'll let somebody else chime in. But the first cut is, is that, um, 
we are still developing uh, specifics about which properties are going to be required for Metrolinks. So at this time, we've just uh, sent letters to a small batch of properties. But as we start down the design road and we have more detail, we'll be reaching out to additional property owners. As far as the 300 meter buffer, I'm not uh, familiar with that. So I'm hoping that somebody else on the team can sort of address that because uh, I'm not aware of that buffer as part of the YNSC project. Yeah, Maybe so, Raj or Stephen, do you want to go uh, ahead on that? Yeah, thanks. I'll, I'll, I'll try and answer the question. And, and so it's, it's something that um, the, the uh, question asker sort of may be aware of, and that is as part of the provincial uh, priority transit project, so the sort of Ontario line, the Scarborough subway extension, our Eglinton extension, and the Young North extension, um, what we as Metrolinx will be doing is designating uh, an area around the subway as transit corridor lands. These lands will be uh, sort of designated as transit corridor lands. And what Metrolinx will have is the ability to issue permits um, associated with work that would be taking place in the vicinity of the transit corridor lands. We're not at that point yet where we've identified transit corridor lands. Uh, we're still working through those details. And so there will be much, much more engagement with communities on that um, in the coming uh, sort of months and through the, the middle part of next year. But that's one aspect that's related to a potential notification. But that would not have happened yet. The other uh, piece that uh, this is likely related to is uh, the GO uh, Rail program. So as you may know, there's significant work taking place on the GO Rail network. And what we'll do is we'll take away the, uh, the question about the 300 meter uh, radius and speak to our GO Rail colleagues and make sure that when we answer all of these questions um, following this meeting, we'll provide some additional details in that. Thank, Thank you, Stephen, for that. Yep. We have a question on, um, we have a question about uh, the subway al alignment uh, that I'll get to now. Perhaps, Stephen, you can start off and uh, if Sam or someone from the tech, tra sorry, Charlie or someone from the technical side wants to jump in. Question is from Teresa Gillies, who has a few questions, but I'll get to uh, one of them now. Why is it that the original plan couldn't make the sharp 90 degree turns and the new plan can make the sharp 90 degree turn. Um, yeah, so that's, that's the first question we can ask the second one after. Yeah, uh, so thank you. So uh, I think I've sort of mentioned uh, before that all of our options uh, protected for the minimum uh, standard 300 millimeter or 300 meter radius curve. And just uh, uh, sort of as we tested all of the options we looked at, again, the options that would travel below the Royal Orchard community, that would travel below the Holy Cross Cemetery, and would travel below the Langstaff Gateway, we wanted to ensure that we protected and met the minimum standards. Because we're building a new piece of infrastructure here, we want to make sure that we're at least achieving the minimum standards. Second thing I'll, I'll mention on this is if you recall when we presented uh, the uh, business case in uh, March of this year, we had sort of our option three, which was the magenta colored option in our initial business case. That option traveled up Young Street, traveled below Kirk Drive, and then up to the CN Corridor. That option uh, protected the minimum 300 meter radius curves. And we looked at using that principle um, on our green alignment. So we are following the minimum standards for our green alignment, meaning 300 millimeter, 300 meter radius curves. Thank you. Uh, next question we have is um, similar um, from Teresa. If the subway goes above ground and away from Young Street, how will it go back underground should the subway be extended further north? So what we are uh, protecting for is a future subway extension along the existing rail corridor. Uh, what we have sort of done through some initial planning work, and there is more planning work to be done, 
but the planning work has identified an opportunity to extend the subway along the rail corridor and provide additional subway service and rapid transit service into more areas of uh, Richmond Hill and Southern York region. As some of you may know, um, the province and uh, the region of York have recently completed the construction of the bus rapid transit project on Young Street. So Young Street is already very well served by rapid transit service. So we don't anticipate bringing the subway back underneath Young Street through a further northerly extension of the subway. Joseph, uh, is there anything in addition that you might want to add to that? Thank you, Stephen. Um, no, I, I think you you have it um, accurately there. We're we're not precluding a farther extension north. Um, we we recently did open that uh, Viva BRT along the mean of Young Street, serving um, the Hillcrest Mall at 16th Avenue, serving Major Mac, um, and going up to Newmarket. Um, and that's that's the focus now, but we always do want to keep our options open. Um, the rail corridor is certainly um, a, a great opportunity um, to look at should, should that ever happen. Thanks, Joseph. And I think Steven. it's safe to say that. I was just going to say that, you know, uh, you know, uh, railroads around the world, you know, use existing infrastructure. And I think this is one of the um, advantages of meeting up with an existing rail corridor that you can travel up. Um, and it's less intrusive. Uh, it's already an existing used railway corridor. Um, so you're able to be more effective and efficient in using uh, infrastructure that's already in place and, and running in parallel there. Thanks, Raj. We're going to go to a few uh, live voice calls now. Uh, Alan will be next, followed by Ed, Hayden, Peter, and then Ian. So, Alan, I'm going to unmute you and you can go ahead and ask your question. Right. Yeah, I actually sent the question into you by the live feed, but my, my concern here is that you seem to be paying lip service to people, but you've already made the decision as to what to do. And one of the main reasons uh, that you're, you're choosing the route you're going on is because you seem to have made Bridge Station as a given, that it has to be there. It seems to me that Bridge Station is very close to, uh, to high tech. To the terminal. So why do we need Bridge Station? I mean, what, what's wrong with looking at alternatives? Like a, even a moving sidewalk might work for a few hundred meters, or the best one I'd have thought would have been a shuttle bus, which could serve that whole area. So not only uh, do you do you service um, one station, but you could service every everybody all the way over to uh, um, right, uh, you know, the other side of the uh, the cemetery right across uh, the, the area just south of the 407. So again, why do we need Bridge Station? What's wrong with an alternative? Thank you, Alan. I'll give this one to Joseph first, and if anyone else wants to jump in. Great, thank you. Um, so the, the big um, uh, appeal and advantage of Bridge Station is that it's located um, both between the the Richmond Hill, uh, the future Richmond Hill developments, and the future developments on the Markham side, and by doing so, not only are we putting a subway station sort of centered on these two developments within walking distance of a lot of residences um, and uh, employment areas and future shops, um, but we're also um, going to have a whole transit terminal there. So it's really going to become a regional transportation hub. Um, and to maximize the connectivity, we really want to make sure um, areas both north and south of uh, Highway 7, 407 have that equitable access um, to, to this transit hub. So so really, it's it's putting putting the transit um, where where we anticipate the demand will be in the future. But, but again, it, it's right next to the terminal, which I thought was the transit hub, because that's where the GO station is, that's where York Region Transit is. Why do we need two stations within a few hundred meters of each other? So it, in the future, the, the, York, the, the current York Region bus loop uh, next to the, uh, the, the Silver City there um, would be really 
relocated to a bus terminal above Bridge Station. Um, it provides for faster access for the east-west routes on Highway 7 and 407. So those are the Viva routes, um, the GO routes, and some local York Region transit routes. Um, and it, it helps uh, achieve the transit benefits of this project by uh, minimizing the, the travel time for transit customers, um, as well as putting just as many people as possible within a 10 to 15 minute walk um, of this integrated transit hub. So if, if, the, if let's say the major bus terminal was north at the high tech location, um, there would be a much longer access time and walk, um, for instance, from people from the Markham side. So it was really just finding that, that sweet spot um, of a centrally located uh, terminal. Now, maybe I'm yeah, stupid, just, but I just, still don't see the reason to, to have two stations next to each other. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. I'll let Stephen answer that, and we'll go to the next person after. Thank you, Alan. Yeah, I just want to uh, say a few more things about Bridge Station, and that is um, – sort of as we all know, this is the point in which sort of all the future and existing rapid transit lines converge, uh, including uh, sort of a improved alignment for the future 407 transit way. So we are looking at, at Bridge Station not as another subway station, but a major transit hub, as Joseph mentioned. And the other question about the proximity or the, the distance between bridge and high-tech stations, um, we know they're close. Um, but what we also know is that area is slated in provincial plans, regional plans, and municipal plans for significant, significant growth. And we've identified Bridge Station as that transit hub that's going to be the connection point of all of those transit services. We also need to offload some of the um, uh, sort of demand for transit um, to High tech station. High tech station is going to be centrally located within the Richmond Hill Center plan area, and it's going to put almost all of the residents of that uh, um, uh, community into walking distance of the subway service. The other aspect of it, and this is an operational aspect, is high tech station is going to be a terminal station. Terminal stations have a number of unique operating uh, uh, requirements. And having high tech station separate from bridge station means that high tech station can operate as a more efficient terminal station. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Joseph. Um, we're going to go to Ed now for another live question. So Ed, I'm going to unmute you and please go ahead. Hi, this is Ed. Thanks for taking my question. I'm a, one of the resident owner that uh, on Thorny Bray that basically have been notified that my home is going to be directly impacted. So I have two following questions for you. Um, noted the simulation that you assure us there's going to be minimum noise and vibration as described whispering of leaves from a distance away and vibration. My question is, those simulations, are they big? And I noted in your slide that the dot in, towards Thorny Bray, the depth beneath our homes has not changed from the original um, proposal. So are those simulations and noise and vibration mitigation that you're basic proposing minimum impact based on the minimum depth to the home or the ideal depth beneath the homes? That's my first question. Now I have a second question. I just want to go back, which I'll come to in a minute. If, if um, you can just answer the first question for clarification, we appreciate it. So maybe I'll start with that one. And uh, Sam Calendron is our sort of noise and vibration expert. And so I'm sure he can uh, provide some um, additional information on this. But uh, our analysis and our study took a look at the actual depths uh, that we're proposing below the homes that we studied. So it was not based on a generic or a, an average. It was based on the actual depths at each of the homes that we looked at in our study. And I'll pass it to Sam to provide some additional uh, detail around uh, the modeling and the analysis that the team has done. Yeah, thank you, Stephen. So uh, as you mentioned, we do look at uh, kind of a selection of receptors along the entire route. Um, so some of the receptors uh, in terms of their depth to the tunnel vary. Uh, and as you mentioned, um, kind of on Thorny Bray and as you kind of head east from Pomona Mills Creek, the, uh, the depth of the alignment has not changed. 
Um, so we did look at actual depths from from kind of basement rooms to to the subway tracks in our analysis, and that's what uh, these conclusions are based on. Um, and in reality, you know, when you get deeper and further away from uh, 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 the subway tracks, the uh, noise and vibration levels uh, will be even lower. So uh, what we're talking about here is really kind of the worst case impacts or, or kind of the most sensitive uh, uh, locations above the tunnel. And I uh, hope that kind of provides a little bit of context to our, uh, our analysis and our process. Sam, so can just you just to also clarify. talk a little Sorry, Sam, yeah, can you just also talk about the importance of the track isolation uh, technology that we're using to sort of really um, uh, articulate how important that track type is versus the tunnel depth? Yeah, so the, uh, the, the, the floating slab track um, in terms of like the level of mitigation offered it, it, it is quite substantial. Um, it's been kind of implemented along, um, you know, many of the existing subway routes where the subway depth, uh, for example, along Shepherd is only about 15 meters. Uh, so we know it's an effective solution at controlling vibration, um, you know, at, at, at similar depths. Um, and the other important thing to note is, is it kind of, uh, you don't really just start and stop uh, it, vibration mitigation, um, it, you know, in, in a specific zone just because there's one house uh, exposed to kind of certain noise and vibration levels. So that vibration isolation or vibration mitigation um, provided for those homes that are kind of along the, the shallow, shallower section of the tunnel will actually provide benefits to kind of that entire community, resulting in kind of the, those low noise and vibration levels um, uh, along the entire route in this area. So just to clarify, just to, so I understand the, what you basically said that the minimum noise and vibration that you, in your presentation is based on the worst case. Yeah. All right. That's, thank you. The second question very quickly is for Steven. Um, I just want to revisit, I don't want to beat this to a dead horse in terms of the difference in terms of the turning radius of the original option and the current option. What I heard you say is that the original turning radi radius going north and the new route both meet the TTC minimum uh, turning radius of 300 meter, correct? Correct. So then it's unclear to me then why the difference um, to the original proposed question, they both meet the both turning radius both original option and the new option, then why is the turning radius of, the, of go, going through underneath the home preferred? Because the original turning radius, even though they both meet TTC standards, was not acceptable in the original proposal, but now it is, even though both of them meet the minimum TTC standard. Thanks for the question. Can you just uh, clarify what you mean by the original proposal? Um, I'm interpreting so original, that as our sort of reference alignment or the orange alignment, but it sounds like you're talking yeah, about yeah. something else. No, 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 no. The original, um, original route that going up Young, turning across, uh, turning north of the cemetery. The original route that we were showing back in March. They said the option one that was the turning radius was too steep or too much. They couldn't work. But now you're saying that the original proposal, the option, original proposal, both, all of them met the minimum turning radius, right? That's in your answer to the previous, mm -hmm. when the questions were asked to previously, that was stated. So it was unclear to me mm -hmm. why, if they both meet the standard, then why this one is being chosen instead of going north, or the options off the table for going north, when it was ruled out that that turning radius originally was not, did not meet your credit, it was too steep, too much of a curve turn. So let me, let me try and answer the question as best I understand it. So um, the original option that you're talking about that stayed on Young Street and turned uh, sort of eastward up through uh, the gateway area, as we describe as option one in the initial business case is the original option that was presented in the work uh, done by the municipalities prior to the upload. That option met all of the uh, applicable uh, turning radii and, and applicable TTC standards. And that was evaluated through our business case process and through that evaluation um, uh, method, it was not preferred over our 
option three, which is the sort of effectively the option that we're proceeding with as the, uh, as the adjusted route is now being presented. If your question is about the Transport Action Ontario option, the one that uh, I presented on the slides earlier this evening, that does not meet the minimum TTC standards. Um, I was quite clear that the radii that uh, were selected for that were 189 meters, and we did that so that we can fully test um, that as an option. But it's important to note that when you look at the plans, they may seem as though the radii are the same, but they are quite different. In actual fact, the 300 meter radius curve is on our green alignment. The yellow alignment or the Transport Action Ontario option as presented was 189 meters, well below the TTC standard. Does that help answer the question? So, um, yes and no. So my question has to nothing to do with the transport alignment was the original municipality okay. option one where the training radius, you said, met the turning curve versus the realignment yep. uh, that, that's currently on the table that you're moving forward with. Both of them meet the turning radius of 300 meters. Then the question is, why, this, why, why choosing this one over going the original turning radius when that was not acceptable previously? Original municipal option one turning radius. Oh, that, that was studied through our business case process, and uh, we went through the detailed evaluation and concluded that the option three, or what is now uh, sort of our adjusted route, is preferred over the option one route. When you take a look at how we evaluate the options through our business case process, we're not just looking at sort of uh, uh, sort of discrete technical aspects. We're looking at sort of the strategic uh, case of it, the economic case, the financial case, and the deliverability and operability case. So there are four cases, each with a significant evaluation process that we go through under those cases to evaluate each of the options. Joseph, do you want to sort of uh, talk about the business case and how we came to the uh, conclusion of option three or our adjusted route? Sure, um, and and also just point out that the business case, the business case guidance, and a lot of the the refined analyses uh, that we have done for the Young North Subway extension are all on Metrolinx's website um, for your for your reference as well. Um, so as as Stephen mentioned, we we. In the business case, we look at four cases. So a strategic case, for instance, talks about sort of the, the broad goals and objectives. Um, are, there, are there city building objectives? Um, what, what is the ridership? Um, what is the connectivity? Um, and and uh, uh, other types of objectives. And so that really lays out the strategy for what we'd want to achieve with the project. Um, the economic case looks at the benefits to society. So it looks at sort of the um, the the aggregate, uh, what are what are the travel time savings sort of for society as a whole with a project in place compared to a business as usual where we don't build a project. Um, we look at uh, quantifying the emissions and also quantifying the cost to society. Um, so from, from the economic case, you get a benefit cost ratio among other metrics to say uh, whether whether the projects uh, you know how positive the project is, the financial case looks at the ability um, to fund the project. So whether we how much certain components of the project costs, I and mean, what the identified funding sources are, and then the deliverability and operations case looks at construction complexity, um, looks at. Uh, you know, and any other additional complexities around the project, whether it relates to day-to-day -day operations um, or how we get shovels in the ground and how we get the project to be built. Um, so looking at those, looking at those four lenses, um, and we we um, get we we get to a point where with with option three, um, a big advantage was the bridge station. Um, so it was the ability to really sort of have this uh, consolidated transit hub, again, serving the communities. It was also the ability to deliver more for the money we had. Um, so we, we were able um, we were able to 
uh, realize cost savings by going along the CN GO corridor, bringing the subway to surface and preventing a lot of um, expensive um, tunneling, particularly for tail tracks north of the station and for building two stations on the surface. Um, and so, so sort of aggregating all that together um, with still very, very high ridership, I think we were estimating around 92,000 daily riders with option three. Um, we, were, we were able, um, looking at the four lenses uh, of the business case to, to sort of recommend that that one be moved forward. Um, Stephen, I'm gonna turn back to you if there's anything specific um, or anything else specific you'd like to pull out there. No, I think that's uh, great, Joseph, and would refer to the to the the sort of audience to the business case if they want to see how we came to the conclusions we did. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks, Back Joseph, you, and thanks for the questions. Ed. Thanks for the questions, Ed. Um, we're going to take a couple of questions before we go to you, Hayden, Peter, and Ram, and Ian on the chat, on the live. We're going to go to two questions in the chat. One is about sound, so I'm going to go to you first, Sam, and then anyone else on the panel can jump in. Question is from Mary, with the sound measurement on a scale of one to 10, one being the least, 10 being the most, can your engineers and technicians provide a number to quantify? Yeah, uh, thanks Azim and thanks Mary for the question. So uh, in terms of the, uh, the the sound levels that we're predicting, um, it would be kind of closer to that one range, uh, you know, for using a one to one to 10 scale, uh, or if you're using a zero to 10 scale, it'd be kind of closer to zero. Uh, what we've shared at uh, kind of previous public meetings is that the uh, the predicted um, uh, sound levels would be, uh, you know, around or below 30, 30 dBA, um, which is kind of equivalent to the, you know, the background sound levels in, in a broad broadcast studio or kind of rustling leaves in a distance. Um, so quite quite low sound levels. Um, and just to re reiterate uh, kind of the, the previous point we made, um, you know, that's kind of at the worst case uh, in the neighborhood. So a lot of the other areas where the tunnels are deeper uh, would be kind of even lower uh, sound noise, noise and vibration levels. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Next question uh, we have, I'll, I'll leave it open to the panel. I don't know, Stephen, if you want to start. It's about, uh, it's from Sydney. And the question in the chat is, what is the projected length of time for the project? And as stations start to be completed, will they open individually or all together once the whole project is complete? Thanks for the question, Sydney. Um, the project will be done. Uh, under two main construction contracts. As I mentioned, the first one that we're going to be uh, proceeding with as far as the main construction contracts go is the tunnel contract. So that's where we're uh, contracting or hiring a contractor to build the tunnels for us. Once that uh, uh, work is finished, the next contract that we'll have is to do the stations, the rails, so putting the tracks into the tunnels, and the systems, so the ventilation, the communication, the train control, so all of those system-related elements. And that is what we refer to as a stations, rails, and systems contract. Timing, so as I mentioned, we are uh, in the early part of next year going to start the procurement process, so the process to hire a contractor to do the work starting early next year with construction on that tunnel contract to start on the back end of 2023. We anticipate that that work will take until 2027 to finish, and that contract for the tunnel work will be done by the end of 2027. While that tunnel is being built, we will hire the contractor to do our stations, rails, and systems uh, work. That uh, contractor will be working with our team to finalize the designs and be ready to start construction in 2027 so that as the tunnel is being finished, our stations, rails, and system contractor is getting out in the field and immediately following with their activities. With the idea that the work would all be finished and uh, ready for in-service as early as 2031, with the only caveat that uh, there is a commitment that the Young North Subway Extension will follow the Ontario line into service. That's because right now, um, the Ontario line is going to be providing some congestion and crowding relief for line one. And uh, it's important that that congestion and crowding relief is provided prior to the Young North Subway extension going into service. Charlie, anything to add there on the construction schedule? 
Yes, um, I'd like to say that we're looking at the contracting methods, as uh, Stephen mentioned, and we were looking at how that could help the construction duration and how we can work together with the contractor with the two contracts. So that's a, uh, let's say, a new strategy. We're working on various contracts, uh, various projects in the subway system. So uh, looking forward to uh, working with everyone on that and the community as, uh, as well. So one thing I do want to stress is the station uh, design. We're in the preliminary stages with that. And I see some questions about the stations. Uh, and those are the things that we would like to work with the community and the stakeholders to get uh, more involvement so that we could uh, look at more detailed timelines on that as well. It would affect the type of stations we put into into service. Thanks, Charlie. And just the one thing I'll I'll add uh, that I forgot to mention in, in the first uh, part of my answer is sort of the opening. Um, it is planned to open the Young North extension as one extension from Finch Station up to High Tech Station. Uh, we are not anticipating, nor do we think it would be appropriate to open it in sections. So one uh, opening once it's all complete around the end of 2031. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Charlie. And thanks for the question. Uh, next, we're going to go back to our live questions. Um, Hayden, you're going to be next, followed by, uh, followed by Peter. I'll unmute you now, Hayden. Please go ahead. Yes. Hello, Stephen. Um, nice to meet you again. I hope this question is hard to you. It's about Bridge Station. Um, so you have mentioned that the Bridge Station is going to connect with five modes of the transit, including the 407 transitway. But we all know that the 407 transitway isn't going to open in 2031. So which means that the goal bus still has to use the Highway 407, which means they either have to exit at Yang or Bayview to access the Bridge Bus Terminal. And as you know, there are so many intersections between them. There's a person, like to get off the highway and get back on, they would take 10 intersections with multiple left turns, which basically mean waiting for three minutes to get a left turn. Um, have Metrolink considered anything that is super directly a off-ramp or on-ramp from Highway 407 directly leading up to the bus terminal to reduce travel time? as is it right next to the highway force. Yeah, so thank you. That, uh, that's an excellent question. Um, and the quick answer is yes, we are looking at that. Um, we're looking at uh, so options uh, for the routes that the GO buses would take off of the 407 and travel um, sort of along Young Street and uh, the sort of connecting road into the bus terminal. Um, we're looking at bus prioritization and what uh, additional measures we need to put along that route to give those uh, buses a priority. And then we are also looking at uh, direct connection options from Highway 407. We're early in that work right now. Um, the technical complexity of that, given the hydro corridor constraints, the interchanges at Bayview and Young Street, it's a very complex piece of work but we are well aware of the benefits uh, of providing direct connections to the highway could provide, and we're looking at, uh, at that as part of our work. The other thing that uh, I just want to sort of mention is we are uh, sort of working to optimize the alignment of the 407 transitway and protect for its direct connection right into the bottom of Bridge Station. And so uh, there is an opportunity for having that uh, 407 transitway connection be directly below Bridge Station. Yes, thanks for that. And the second question is about um, the early construction work at Finch. Um, how are you going to impact the operation of buses around that area? Because like before the pandemic, uh, the Toronto did some work along uh, Yang Street between Finch and Steels for some, some work, and it was a nightmare for buses. They delayed for 30 minutes, and the auto bus take alternative routes. How, how is it going to impact like, this construction? Yeah, so as far as our work at Finch goes for the Early Works contract, um, it is what I'll refer to as relatively invisible work. This is sort of us working in the existing station, getting it all ready for uh, the tunnels to come in and connect to it, and for the various systems like the communications and the power systems to simply plug into Finch Station. Right now, we don't have that simple connection point. And the Finch Early Works contract is to create that simple connection point. 
So we're not anticipating that the traffic disruptions along Yonge Street will be significant. However, I will say that um, as part of our work, uh, we do need to put in some traffic uh, sort of lane restrictions on Hendon, which is the sort of east-west intersection uh, just on the south side of the Finch Terminal um, that uh, sort of will have um, traffic impacts. But we don't anticipate those impacts will affect Young Street, and we don't anticipate that those uh, sort of those um, uh, uh, restrictions will impact Young Street nor the buses on Young Street. However, when I fast forward to our advanced tunnel contract, if you think about how we're going to be building the tunnel, we're starting in sort of the Langstaff Gateway area and tunneling uh, south all the way towards Finch. When our tunnel boring machines arrive just north of Finch Station, what we're going to need to do is essentially excavate the road, remove the tunnel boring machines, and then close the road back up. So there will be traffic restrictions on Young Street that will affect uh, um, uh, sort of the, the traffic operations and will and uh, sort of will affect the, the bus operations. And we'll have to work incredibly closely with uh, the City of Toronto traffic uh, folks and the Toronto Transit Commission and York Region Transit as the bus operators going in and out of Finch to make sure that uh, those impacts are absolutely minimized. And from a timing standpoint, um, as I mentioned, our tunnel contract is sort of 2023 to 2027 timeframe. The uh, sort of extraction of those tunnel boring machines down at Finch will be taking place sort of towards the, the later part of 2026 and into 2027, just from an expectation and timing standpoint. Thank you, Stephen. I'm just going to jump in here and say it's 7.56, so we're heading towards our 8 o'clock time frame. We're going to stick around. We're going to keep answering some questions. I know there's still hands up in the Zoom room, so uh, we're going to keep going, but I just wanted to acknowledge that we are heading towards the time that we'd said we were ending. Um, I also just want to remind everyone, if you send your questions in through Engage, we will answer them. You will get an answer to your questions or into the chat as well. So I'll hand it back to you there, Azim. Thank you. Thanks, Leona. And just a quick uh, shout out for elected officials that are here or have been here today. Uh, MP Lanceman, Mayor Scarpetti, Acting Mayor DePaula, and um, Deputy Mayor Hamilton, as well as Councillors Irish and Clevitz. Just wanted to give uh, the American acknowledgement that they are here. Um, now I'm going to go to um, Peter for another live chat question, and then Ram, you're after Peter. So uh, go ahead, Peter. Um, one is not a question, it's a request. Uh, the PowerPoint presentations that you guys just gave, it wasn't very clear. Like I couldn't make out any of the writing on the uh, on the maps or the graphs that you guys have in the PowerPoint presentation. Um, and you couldn't really see the route and, you know, where this, you know, new subway line is going to go in. Is there any way that we can get a clear presentation to see you know, what you guys were showing us. Hmm. Because to me, looking at it on my screen here, it was just a blur. I mean, you can see the, the colors and everything, but you couldn't see writing and what was in the presentation. Could we get a clear presentation if possible? Leona, can we confirm what uh, we posted the presentation on Metrolinks Engage, right? Yes, and um, we'll just double check and make sure, but it'll be there and easily accessible for everybody. Okay. And so it'll be, be posted clear. on the tool. Let's engage if it's not or if it's not already up there right now. Sorry to talk over you. That's okay. No worries. Uh, my real question is the um, the vibration and the ongoing vibration of the and the potential long term damage of our building. I live in eight one one Long Street, and you guys are saying that it's going to go right directly below our building, right? In regardless of the depth. Um, you. You know, do you guys have any idea what the vibration would be like and what the impact that would have on our building? I mean, my concern is I would hate to have another, you know, collapsed building because of, first of all, you're taking out, you know, material from underneath our building, right? Like, I don't know how much that's going to affect, you know, stresses load over area, right? So you're going to have a lot of load. I mean, you got 18, 19 floors on this building. It's not a single family home, you know, which has got, you know, like one hundredth of the weight of this building. Um, now, have you guys considered that? Like, what kind of impact that would have? Like, first of all, taking out all that area below our property. I mean, 
well, the engineer will probably be able to talk to this a lot better, right? Because my ing I have an engineering background and I know about this stuff, right? So I'm just asking the question, how much would that impact our building by taking the area from under our building and then the vibration, the long-term vibration? Thanks, Peter. I'll, I'll let Sam, our noise and vibration expert, start with this on the vibrations part of it. Yeah, hi, Peter. Thank you for your question. So uh, in terms of the, the predicted vibration levels um, during during operation, as as you noted, it, they're, they're well below um, the threshold of human perception so that, you mean, you know, if you, if you touch the wall or the floor, uh, there's no perceptible vibration. Uh, and, and the limits for kind of vibration that you can feel are several orders of magnitude lower than vibration that can even cause a concern for uh, for structural damage. So the, not not the levels that would would cause construct uh, vibration damage, but uh, levels that would you know cause a concern. So we're talking about uh, operational vibration levels that are you know well 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 below um, the levels that that would cause uh, you know any kind of damage to uh, to structures. Um, as part of our, you know, construction process, uh, we do complete kind of precondition surveys to document uh, uh, what the conditions of those structures are. And uh, during construction, um, you know, we do monitor uh, uh, those vibration levels as well. So there's a lot of protections in place uh, to kind of uh, ensure that the, uh, the vibrations, both during construction and operation, uh, don't reach those levels that would cause a, a concern uh, for structural damage. Um, and just in terms of like this particular location, 80, 8111, this is, you know, the deepest point on uh, on, on the existing subway network, I, I believe. So it, it's quite a far distance from uh, the tunnel to the uh, to the building itself. Um, so hopefully that answers your question on the on the vibration part. So, yeah. Uh Oh, sorry, Charlie. Go ahead. Oh no, sorry. I, I was going to mention that um, because um, you said you're an engineer, so maybe we could talk about the technical items we're we're doing. Um, A one eleven is a very uh, critical building. We are it's on our minds, uh, and we did do um, a survey, visual surveys first, and then we will be doing condition surveys, uh, and then we will be doing a finite uh, uh, modeling, and uh, we are doing. Um, right now uh, analysis on those uh, that building and how it's impacting on the tunnel and that's part of our due diligence work uh, as well as uh, soil servers that uh, we're doing in part of our geotechnical work so um, a lot of work has been done to make sure that we uh, obviously any construction impacts that are happening uh, within the tunnel uh, any excavation or anything like that that uh, it, it's minimized and if there's anything we find we would uh, provide uh, also mitigation actions, but at this time we're still in that uh, review stage and modeling stage. Yeah, it, just a couple of uh, follow-up points on that one. Uh, key to, to note, and I think I mentioned it when I was talking about the profiles, is the uh, tunnels as they pass below uh, 8111 Young will be in bedrock. So we don't anticipate any impacts on uh, the 8111 building as a result of the tunnels. Nonetheless, as Charlie mentioned, um, it is sort of identified as sort of a, a critical structure because we are tunneling below a, a multi-story building. So we uh, will be having uh, that uh, detailed uh, monitoring uh, plan in place. And so that uh, as the tunnels pass below the building, we know exactly what is happening and our contractors can customize and tweak how they are operating the tunnel boring machine so that there will be no impact. That's it. Thanks, Susie. Thank you, Stephen. I think we're having some muting and unmuting problems in the Zoom room right now. So I'm just going to head back to our engage page questions here um, and get to the next one we've got. Why aren't you listening? Municipal councils in Markham and Vaughan voted against option three. Both candidates for federal office in the recent election were against option three. Both candidates in the upcoming provincial election are against option three. And you haven't listened to any of our elected representatives. How can you possibly call that consultation? I'm going to start with you, Raj, I think, on this one. And then we can go to anyone else who wants to jump in. Thanks, Leona. And thanks, thanks for the question. Um, we have been listening. We have been listening from the moment that we released the initial business case eight months ago. Um, and where we are here today on the improved route is a result of the community feedback that we've received, the feedback that we've received and we've heard from our municipal partners. 
it, it's all due to that and it's all because of that and and we're going to continue to do that um we've landed on um the improved route and as stephen mentioned that is the route that we're going to be moving forward with uh we did our complete due diligence in a community proposal review um which took months a full analysis like we would do in a business case to ensure that we looked at everything we no stone unturned um, and uh, a lot of time effort and energy spent by technical teams across the board and experts um, and 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 that's how we want it that's how we want to bring this project forward that we want to do our utmost uh, best to ensure that we're, we're 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 looking at all options and we've done that and and we've now uh, got our improved route um, that we're moving forward with um, and we're going to continue to look at, you know, uh, refinements to the route to 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 do more to to maximize more benefits to 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 minimize any sort of um, uh, concerns that are being expressed and raised. Um, and uh, you know, that's that's how we build transit, and we're going to continue to build transit, you know, uh, across our network. Thank you, Raj. I think we're okay in the Zoom room now. Azim, are you there? I'm here. Thanks, Leona. Appreciate it, Raj. Uh, we're going to go back to the live calls, and I believe we have Ian Reed, who's next. Ian, I'll unmute you, and you have the floor. Hi, Zim. How are you? Good, thanks. How are you, Ian? Um, I think um, congratulations in order. Were you just on paternity leave? <laughs> I was, yes. Thank you. Appreciate congratulations. it. <laughs> um, I got a little bit of a two-parter here, and Joseph mentioned this earlier. You know, the maximum benefits of this transit-oriented oriented community um, go to the select developers up in um, the Richmond Hill Centre and uh, Langstaff Gateway. It seems like quite a plum in terms of the uh, enhancement of their asset. Um, and so what they're getting are walkable stations up there. Um, the most northern part of the route is the rail orchard community as you curve under a community. Um, I don't understand if this is fait accompli, and obviously you guys consider the green line is the final alignment. Um, why is Royal Orchard even in question as a station? Um, you know, we've got the catchment for this area is, you know, the Green Park um, at Royal Orchard and Young. We obviously have intensification all the way up Young. Excuse me, but why these select developers get this incredible benefit into the future when the here and now, the intensification in the here and now, including Toronto ladies, including what's going to happen at uh, Shouldice, including what's going to happen all along this route. Um, I, you know, I kind of think I'd like to be, you know, that development industry that's, that's got the, um, that's got uh, Langstaff Gateway and uh, Richmond Hill Centre. Uh, could somebody answer that question, please? Yeah, th Even thanks Ian for the question. I'll, I'll, yeah, sorry, Azim. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Ian, for the question. And, and I'll start. And if there's uh, sort of any additions from a, a benefit side, perhaps Joseph can uh, jump in. But uh, a couple of things I just really want to uh, sort of be clear and express to this group. Um, we have planned our transit project on the basis of the in place plans that the province has through the provincial growth plan, the region has through the regional official plan, and the municipalities have through their official plans and secondary plans. And all of those plans have identified the Richmond Hill Centre and Langstaff Gateway area as an uh, urban growth centre slated for intensification and development. So when we take a look at our route and our station placements, we are looking at those in-place plans that the municipalities and the province have. We're not looking at landowners, we're not looking at uh, uh, development potential. We are using in-place plans that uh, have been developed uh, through uh, municipal and, and provincial processes. Second thing I, I, I want to mention is, um, so I know uh, some of you may have attended uh, sort of the recent transit-oriented communities uh, open houses over the last week. What's really important uh, to understand is the province including Infrastructure Ontario and Metrolinx through the uh, subway program and the Transit Oriented Communities program is planning transit first. So we have planned our transit project first, taking a look again at those uh, provincial and uh, municipal plans for uh, growth and uh, land use and based our subway decisions on the basis of where the people and jobs currently are and where the people and jobs will be in the future. And as we know, 
the province and the municipalities have identified Richmond Hill Centre and Langstaff Gateway as a urban growth centre slated for massive uh, intensification and development. And we've placed our transit uh, stations there to, uh, to meet those people and jobs because that will be the highest number of people and jobs over the life cycle of the project. Which when we think about it follow- is 100 years. Okay, ag- agreed, agreed, Stephen. So just one quick follow-up comment. Anything to add on that, Joseph? Sure. I, I also just you know, want to remind you that, that this line isn't just serving people who live directly next to the line. Um, you know, anyone who stands, let's say, at the corner of Young and Steele's, I guess, you know, pre-COVID during rush hour, you'd see that sort of nonstop line of buses all feeding into Finch Station. This line is really a regional asset. It's connecting people, um, you know, through through bus connections, all these stops in the bus terminals. Um, to, to many destinations, whether, you know, the, the Bathurst and Promenade area um, at Clark, um, you know, destinations in uh, farther north in York region, Richmond Hill um, at, at Bridge and High Tech, um, and the employment centers uh, east along Highway 7 around uh, Beaver Creek. Um, they're... Sorry? I apologize, Joseph. I thought, Sorry, I thought I heard something. Um, so the, the the point is that this this is really this is really sort of serving it's serving the region. It's driving benefits to users um, all all through York region. Um, and I will turn it over to uh, Michael uh, Fetishin uh, to talk about the TOC. Yeah, hi there, and uh, thanks for passing that along, Joseph. Um, I, I'd say three things from the TOC side, and we actually we got this question uh, in our bridge station um, uh, consultation the other night. So if, if there's, a, as Stephen said, if there's a tail and a dog in this equation, TOC is the tail, uh, not the dog. And so we, we react to the, the transit planning, not really the other way around. Uh, second thing I'd say is that both bridge and high tech uh, or, or the variants of the various plans that um, uh, that those those stations have become have have ended up on the same developers' lands in every single case. The the developers in both the, these locations own expansive land tracts, and when we look at the variants of alignments that have been uh, you know contemplated through the business case process that Steve Collins alluded to, um, we're always landing in that same development. The last thing I'd say on on favoring that developer. In fact, the central location of these, uh, particularly in the Langstaff uh, gateway area, actually benefits the non-TOC developer uh, disproportionately to what the original reference alignment did when it was out on Young. So now, within an 800 or so meter meter radius, uh, we cover almost the entirety of the Langstaff gateway area, which includes many non-TOC partner lands uh, to the east of, uh, of the existing rail corridor where back when we were uh, out at Young or in that variant, 800-meter uh, radius would have barely crossed the tracks. So the, the argument that uh, this somehow disproportionately um, benefits those, uh, the, the TOC partner uh, developers here is, is simply not the case. Just one, fo- one follow-up if I'm not um, unmuted. Yeah, go ahead, Ian. Sorry, so um, just as a general comment, I mean, wouldn't um, the Royal Urcher Station um, serve as a de facto transit-oriented neighborhood? I mean, I, I don't know, how about a TON? If we intensify along Young Street um, and future development, if you're talking 100 years out, 100 years out is my house going to still be here? Um, is the land value going to be such that there will be intensification within the rural orchard community? I mean, we are talking about the future. We're talking about an intensification. Um, I just think I understand that roughing out a subway station is 80% of the cost of actually building one. And if you're thinking to the future, which is what you're talking about, should we not be building a walkable station hands down? You know, no, like no argument at Royal Orchard. Um, this would enhance our property value. This would make our neighborhood walkable. Um, you know, there's all these, these sort of low density developments along Young Street that surely are going to end up being condominium developments. And, you know, I guess, again, um, we will have no access to the closest station to us, pretty much. It won't be walkable. Um, anyway, I just, 
you know, I would like to see the Royal Orchard community treated fairly. That's all I have to say. Yeah, I understood Ian, and and I'll just sort of uh, say the, the Royal Orchard Station is not off the table. It's uh, as I as I mentioned, um, it continues to be advanced in the planning side to keep uh, it uh, ready for implementation, if the decision is made to include it in the project. And your remarks about the intensification potential along, uh, especially the Markham side of uh, Young Street through the Royal Orchard area, is being considered and has been considered in our analysis. So. Um, all uh, great points, and uh, it is not off the table. Thanks, Stephen, and uh, the panel. Thanks, Ian, for your question. Uh, Ram, I apologize. I know you've been waiting patiently. I'm going to uh, pass it to you, and then Sydney, and then Rosanna. Go ahead, Ram. Hello, good evening. Um, um, I, I live on Thorny Bray, and my house is one of the directly affected houses. And all of your um, uh, assurance on the noise and uh, vibration being below the human average human perception rate. And uh, I, I would like to ask what about the non-average humans? Because, you know, usually the non-average humans are the ones that are most uh, vulnerable. Uh, my child is with autism and ADHD. Their perception and reception to noise and vibration is a way bigger and more intense than the average human. And uh, it, uh, it has a great uh, damage on his mental health, on his uh, behavior, etc., etc., etc. Are you able to scientifically guarantee that the non-average humans will be also have a, a, a very next to none noise and vibration perception? Sam, uh, I'll, I'll defer to you first as a noise and vibration expert and if anyone else wants to jump in. Thanks, Rob. Thank you. Yeah, I could, uh, I could answer that. So the, uh, the, the vibration levels that we're predicting, again, this is kind of with, with mitigation, like with, with things like floating slab track, are, are quite, quite low. And uh, they are actually below the threshold of, 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 of human perception. Um, so much so that even I, as kind of like a trained expert, um, kind of looking for these things, uh, cannot feel vibration levels, uh, the vibration at these levels. Uh, so, so they're they're quite low, and and, and kind of based on um, you know all the scientific evidence, all the surveys out there, uh, really the, the 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 physical vibration is is, is a non-issue. Uh, what it really comes down to is, is the sound levels, and and we've provided some some examples of you know kind of like sound levels in a broadcast studio. Uh, kind of rustling leaves in the distance. These are all kind of very quiet uh, background sound levels, right? Uh, and, and so these types of sound levels, as far as I know, um, you know, are, are prevalent in, in, in your environment today. Like your, you know, your refrigerator makes kind of very quiet sounds, uh, things like that. So um, these types of sounds are not known to kind of affect, uh, you know, uh, humans in general. Uh, so. Uh, uh, and, and that's kind of why the standards are based on, on, on these levels to kind of limit those human impacts. Um, so I, hopefully that, that answers your question. Yeah, I mean, it does, but I mean, uh, I guess uh, with, uh, I mean, I know from the community because we work together that there are more, I mean, there are a group of kids with different mental health conditions in the community and they're, one of the criteria why parents have chosen this community is because of its uh, quietness and peacefulness. So I guess it would be uh, important, significantly important to, to, to have a, a specified research about the effect of, uh, of uh, this noise and vibration on, on, on individuals with mental health uh, uh, challenges. I see a number of my colleagues are, are nodding their heads, and I think yes. we're going to take that way. And, 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 and thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and I know that um, we, we've already talked a little bit about the noise and vibration experiential program that you know we'll hopefully have ready for um, uh, early early in uh, 2022. Um, some of the constructs that you know are going into that into that program are some, a lot of the work that Sam has already shared that they've they've done a lot of. 
um, baseline measurements. And, and uh, another team has been in homes in Royal Orchard um, taking baseline measurements at the basement, mid floor and, and second floor level. And from that, they're applying, you know, what we're expecting at worst case scenarios um, to develop this, this experiential program. Um, so, you know, that, that, that's one offer that we will have to the community to come in, to experience for yourself, hear for yourself um, what we're talking about. Because, you know, as we talk about numbers and we talk about decibel levels and human perception, I think it, it, the reality is going to be coming in and, and, and witnessing it for yourself. Um, so that offer will be made available um, to anyone who wants to come in. Um, we're eager to get that set up. Um, but we'll also have a mobile demonstration on on the vibration kind of technology that will be used. It's obviously a small scale model. Um, but we'll be able to demonstrate, you know, uh, with with floating slab technology, with the rubber pucks, what that actually does to the actual vibration levels. And uh, Stephen and I saw a glimpse of that last week with the with the group that's developing that that. And uh, I, I I was amazed. Um, and so, you know, we're really looking forward to actually bringing that to the community for, for everybody to witness firsthand. Thank you. Thanks, Raj, and, and thanks. You, oh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, uh, it's Maria here. I just wanted to add um, to what Sam has said and, and Raj, that EA documents are legally binding documents, and the commitments that we make in the EA and we'll be making in our EPR addendum, um, including commitments related to noise and vibration, um, predicted levels. We take those very seriously and we do include them in our contracts and we make sure that those commitments are adhered to. And I would also say that, you know, uh, as I mentioned that our, our CEO um, had, had shared uh, an open letter yesterday and uh, that also is a, our commitment to the community in writing. Thanks Raj, Maria and Sam, and thank you for the question, Rob. Uh, we have two more live questions and then we'll throw it back to you, Leanna. I know we're about uh, 20 minutes past eight, but uh, we'll, we'll go through the questions as much as we can. Uh, Rosanna, I'm gonna go to you and then Sydney. Go ahead, Rosanna. Sorry, you're still on mute. There we go. Apologies. Now, now you can try. Oh. I don't think we can hear you, Rosanna. You're unmuted on our side, but I think maybe from your side you're muted. You can take a look. Okay, we'll try to we'll try to resolve that. Um, or, or we can if you can type your question in, uh, if that works. In the meantime, I'm going to go to Sydney and we'll, we'll jump back to you, Rosanna. Sorry about that. Hi, are you able to hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Hi. Hi. Um, so thank you uh, for answering my previous question on the projected length of time for the um, the construction. Um, I just wanted to also ask, just because um, my mother and I are directly affected, we live in uh, 235 Baythorn, the, the apartment building, and there's been talk just of Metrolinx um, buying the building, but after listening or seeing the um, PowerPoint presentation, um, I was just, I got confused hearing if um, Metrolinx is just buying the land underneath the building. And I just was wondering if you could clarify that. And if, if Metrolinx is buying like the building, if we would have to, like the residents would be affected or have to, you know, move or anything like that or yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you for that one. Um, maybe perhaps I'll go to Maria Doyle first from property. Thanks, Azim, and thanks. I think that's Sydney, correct? Uh, thank you, Sydney, for the question. So um, from my understanding, and I, I, without looking at a map and understanding where your building is, if your building has been identified to have a tunnel under the building, Metrolinx would be looking at acquiring the property under the building. So um, an example that I like to use, and I think it works well, is if you think of your apartment building as a layer cake, so you live in the top layer, you know, your building being the cherry, 
you know, your land, your, you know, if your grassy space or parking area would be, you know, the top icing of your cake. But then if you look down the next la layer or the layer below, so the second or third layer of your cake, that would be where the tunnel would go. And that would be the land that Metrolinx would be looking at acquiring. So once we identify what the particular uh, area of land that is required for the project, we would be coming back to the owner of the building. If this case is this is a, a rental, we would be talking to the land owners and talking to them directly about um, compensation for the land that we are taking under the building. And what that would mean is that we would go and get fair market value appraisals by a third party independent appraiser and bring that uh, offer up to the landowner at that time. Um, as I said earlier, right now, it's a little bit early in the process to say exactly where the tunnel will be and exactly how much land is impacted. But as it's a tunnel under the ground, substantially, I think, you know, if it's closer to Young Street, it's several, uh, 20 plus meters below the ground at that area. We wouldn't be disturbing the top layer of the cake. We wouldn't be disturbing the building. We wouldn't be looking at acquiring the building itself or moving any residents out at this time. However, like I said, I can't talk specifics to this building because I'm not exactly sure where it is and which building you're talking about. So that's sort of a general statement. Yeah, if I can just uh, sort of add on to that. Thanks, Maria, and thanks, Sydney, for the question. Um, so at this point in time, we haven't identified the need to sort of buy the building at 235 Baythorn. This is sort of the six-story um, uh, apartment building on the north side of Baythorn Drive. Uh, what Maria just mentioned about sort of buying those layers uh, deep below um, the building is what we would be uh, looking to acquire from the owners of 235 Baythorn. So um, similar to uh, sort of being very, very deep, uh, we're very, very deep at this location and uh, sort of would not uh, sort of have any uh, effects on the surface. Thanks, Maria. Thanks, Stephen. The other, uh, the other, sorry. Yeah, sorry. The other um, aspect is uh, we do uh, sort of as we're going through the community uh, doing our borehole investigations, uh, really what we uh, need to do is do some boreholes at 235 Baythorn. So that uh, is also work that would be done uh, there. But as far as the uh, the property uh, acquisition, it just would be sort of uh, the tunnels uh, deep below the building, not the building itself. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Maria. Uh, Rosanna, well, I think you're on unmute now. Let's give one more shot. If you're still there. I think we lost you, Rosanna. Okay, no problem. If you can uh, send your question through Engage or, or message us via email, we'll be happy to get through, get through to that. So thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for all the live questions on Zoom. I'm going to pass it back to you now, Leona. Thank you, Azim. Okay, with that, thank you to everyone for joining us this evening. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to those who asked a question. Your feedback is welcome and appreciated. If you haven't already, please sign up for the Young North Subway Extension newsletters to stay informed about the project and be notified about upcoming public events. And um, we mentioned too that we know are coming uh, very soon. So right after the holidays, we will have another open house on the same subject um, the first week of January, January 5th. And then we're also going to be having the virtual open house around the environmental project report sometime end of January, early February. So stay tuned for all of that. Thank you again. Good night and stay safe, everybody.